today we have uh, three gentlemen. Uh, I'll just give them uh, give a short introduction. Uh, Ira Perman uh, is president of a group called Important Work. He was born in Brooklyn in 1952, a very young man. He studied geology and at Bucknell and graduated from Boston University in theater arts. So he's kind of run the whole gamut from science to art. Uh, he came to Alaska in 1975 during the height of the construction of the pipeline. And some of you remember how wild those times were. Uh, he spent 20 years uh, uh, with the performing arts, uh, served as executive director of the Anchorage Concert Association uh, from 81 to 2000, and is, as president of the Alaska Humanities Forum from 2001 <coughs> to 2006. And one of the things I really admire about the work that he's done Oh, in my last stint in the Senate, I tried to get Alaskan history into the schools, but failed. All I got was a commission. But under his leadership, they, he spearheaded the effort to require Alaska history and culture as a requirement for graduation. So that, I think, is very important. And so, uh, so that's, uh, he is also now executive director of the Atwood Foundation. And uh, next to him is one of my star students, <laughs> uh, Brad Keesley, has taken my course twice. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's president and principal uh, with Keesley Consulting and Alaska based oil and gas and fiscal policy, a group he founded in 2013. He also has a blog called Thoughts on Alaska Oil and Gas and has been a, a contributor to uh, Alaska Business Monthly. And uh, before that, he was a partner uh, and co-head of oil and gas practice at Perkins Coie, uh, and, and the firm's Anchorage and DC office. And before that, he was with Do Jones Day, a global law firm, and he has a, also a long list of other uh, experiences in the law. Okay, and uh, um, you might want to expand on that. The third person is uh, someone uh, very close to the university. I've been reading Scott Goldsmith's uh, material for half my lifetime. <laughs> Not quite. But uh, uh, he, he's been a member of the faculty uh, in, in the Institute of Social and Economic Research from 75 to 2013. And he was a director from 2001 to 2005. And uh, his interests include regional economics, Alaska fiscal policy, and energy demand. And he's constructed several economic models which have been used by the Institute for a whole variety of public policy analyses and projections. And uh, he's been active in uh, professional service, served as a scientific advisory committee uh, of the Minerals Management Service of the U.S. Department of Interior. He was also formerly chairman of the Anchorage Municipal Budget Advisory Commission and served as a member of the Alaska Bypass Mail Post Office Task Force, very in, important to rural Alaska, and by the University of Alaska Foundation. So he finished uh, uh, at Princeton, got a PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin, and served uh, for two years in Borneo. So he's got a fantastic background. He's now semi-retired. So gentlemen, thank you for coming. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, coming to listen to this. We have some other guests here, I see, who just, just joined, but I'm going to have everybody have a chance in a moment to introduce themselves to us. First, I'd like to offer uh, maybe a bit of an apology. Those of you who signed up for this course thinking I was going to do a presentation on the Norway's uh, oil and gas development, I apologize. Not that anybody did. But for several years, uh, uh, Willie Hensley's asked me to come and do a presentation on uh, what a number of us who went to Norway learned about how Norway uh, develops its oil and gas. And I'm sure you've all heard, you know, wondrous stories about the size of their permanent fund and how good their economy is and how good their, their social services are and the like. And uh, it became an aspiration for many of us. However, I thought we'd take a break from, from that this time, and I promise I'll come back and do that at, a, at another time. But um, there's clearly a, a, a very pressing a concern that's in the minds of Alaskans in the last couple of months. And uh, first of all, were all of you there last night? Who was there last night? So just almost everybody was there last night. So um, 
and you got to hear Brad's presentation. And uh, Brad's presentation was a distillation, if I may say is that about right, mm -hmm. of what we're about to do tonight. So um, I asked Brad and I asked Scott, who know much more about this subject of the impact of uh, low oil prices than I do, to uh, put together the, the presentation. So the three of us worked on this. Uh, these are the two guys who did the, the heavy data lifting. And um, what we're going to do is pass this back and forth between us, uh, kind of a go around. But first, what I'd like to do, give you an overview. Um, this is the framework for the presentation today, and it's going to talk about where we are today with a brief look back, brief meaning just a couple of years actually, to see how we got to where we are. Um, and as you saw last night, you're going to uh, hear more about what's ahead for revenues. We're talking, you know, state revenues, and this is all about the state, but in the state budget, um, we're going to look at. Um, a bit more than, than we did last night, uh, what are some of the alternatives? Uh, take a look at, you know, we heard a pretty gloomy story last night. Did everybody come, go away happy? <laughs> I, know, I certainly was kind of gloomy. But there are, there are in fact, some alternatives uh, leading to what this presentation is titled, The Way Forward, some specific suggestions of what, uh, what can be done in, in, a, in the years ahead and how it, what it takes to make it all happen. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of go around the room and first of all, you know, tell us your name and what you do, but in addition to that, if you would, uh, tell the three of us, what was your takeaway from last night? What's, what's most on your mind? And that'll, I think, help us in terms of as we, f we respond and focus uh, our comments. So I'll, I'll just start over here with, with you. Uh, Jeff Dixon and uh, currently a Takeaways from last night. Um, yeah, uh, just what the um, what Alaska is going to mean to uh, myself and my family ten years from now. And, uh, what is our current commitment to uh, Alaska based on numbers such as that? Ten years. Family commitment, all, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Carla Erickson, also a student in the Master's Public Administration program here. During the day, I'm a supervising attorney for the Child Protection Section of the Attorney General's Office. Um, and last night, I went home and talked to my husband about getting some more rice and beans and stocking <laughs> up yeah. projects and should we sell the house, you know, kind of thing, get ready for doomsday. But uh, yeah. I mean, that's a little dramatic. <laughs> 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 And I'm like, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed, ready to go out there and do things. Um, it was last night, I was like, oh no, because I just bought a house. And I'm like, oh god, no. And so it kind of made me panic a little bit. But then I was like, wait, you know, I, I mean, my dad was an oil man and I grew up, I grew up here, my family's from here. Um, I'm a shareholder, like, you know, and I'm, I'm not really as worried. I just, I'm hopeful for the future. And I, I'm really hopeful that you guys know what you guys are doing. And, uh, <laughs> because, sure. you know, like, this is our future, and, like, this is my generation, and, like, you know, when I have kids, they're going to, you know, we just, I don't know, it's, it was interesting to see, but, you know, there's no, there's no point to panic. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm kind of, it made me kind of realize, like, maybe we, like, you know, like, my corporation, we should get together and talk a little bit about right. this. Time is on your side. Yeah. Good. I should t say uh, I got a call this morning from my daughter, who's the same age as you, just graduated, and her first job in the in the oil industry, and that and, and the uh, and she said I just I just read the, the papers this morning. Is it really that bad? <laughs> <laughs> so, and so I, I kind of got the first hand experience. What, on what that. was your answer to that? 
No, I said, of course not, of course not. <laughs> Actually, she, we'll talk about her, she had a very intelligent response, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, my name is Sherry Heritage, I'm a student here in the MBA program. And last night, it wasn't really a surprise because we're watching the gas prices of the pumps go down, so it's kind of bittersweet. Yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> nice know? once a week. But uh, it, it was, um, yeah, it wasn't up to <laughs> The charts were, were not pretty. <laughs> yeah, and Ian Ivat Smol, I'm originally from Israel. I'm in the MBA program. Uh, last night's presentation was somewhat pessimistic, but I think very realistic, and that was good. And one thing that came across my mind, the same people that say that the price may be $82 also say that it may be $200 a few years ago, and they were wrong. So you can take it for whatever it's worth. The other thing, unfortunately, as one from the Middle East, I know, you know the likelihood of another conflict or war there is very likely, and that's probably spiked the price. <laughs> so, I mean, I hate to say that, yeah, but that's true. probably also a realistic scenario that we can somewhat rely on. Mm -hmm. I'm Susan Ruddy, and I am retired. Um, here for the pleasure of hearing from people like you. My reaction last night was going in, it was, oh my gosh, how many times have I been to conferences where we've talked about the fiscal cliff? <laughs> We are about to go over the fiscal cliff. I can't, it's been uh, 30 years of fiscal <laughs> cliffs ahead of us. Uh, so I would like to know, I'd like to understand why this one is so different. Good question. Um, my reaction to the decline in oil price is worry as an, as an Alaskan and also concern that it will increase consumption on our part as people who drive cars and fly in airplanes because it's costs us less, which is not a, a plus for the environment if we're using more and more of these fossil fuels. Um, I was grateful that uh, Greg Erickson suggested some very concrete steps. And I don't know whether you agree with those concrete steps, but I'm glad you're going to talk about what it does it take to get there from here, and whether those kinds of things that he mentioned last night are part of the solution. I'm Jack Roderich. I didn't go last night, but I've heard this discussion somewhat. Um, as I mentioned to Scott just a few minutes ago, there's a lot more oil to be found in Alaska. The Arctic Slope is, uh, I've heard geologists say, it's bigger than the Gulf of Mexico, potentially. I know a lot of it's going to be offshore, and we've got to get our share of that. But there's a lot to be found on the slope in the future. So I tend to be a bit of an optimist. Sure, the pipeline's going down and blah, 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 all that. But we're an oil state, and we're going to remain that way. And the potential is huge. So. I know we're, mm -hmm. we're in trouble, and you guys will tell us how much, but I, I have that optimistic view long term. Sorry, I didn't mean to make noise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Amanda Coyne, and um, I uh, was there last night. And um, yeah, I, I really agree with what Jack said there. Is, but I, when, I, when I didn't hear it was how uh, what the resource was left up there. And I think, what is the EIA's? Brad, you guys should know this, 40 billion, something, something like that, barrels of oil uh, still left to, be to, to, still left to be discovered. And I guess I don't hear a whole lot of talking about how, um, what we could do as a state to get that, help to get that out of the ground. I just don't hear that. I hear how much we're going to get. Are we going to get seven? Are we going to tax it, you know, 32.2? Are we going to tax it 30? Are we going to tax it 25? Are we, there's all this discussion. I mean, for years we've spent having those discussions and not, I don't feel like there's been nearly enough focus on what we can do as a state to try to incentivize and, um, and you know, fighting about, you know, whether or not we're going to tax at 30 or 32 or 35, which is probably not the way to, to, to start that discussion. So, anyway, that's what I, that's what I got. I'm Bill Cronick, uh, uh, semi kind of retired, I guess you'd say, but uh, <clears throat> my takeaway from the uh, get together last night was that, uh, you know, I vaguely understood the, the uh, crunch we were coming up on, and, 
it, it pretty well uh, laid it out and, and uh, pretty clearly. Uh, like a lot of other folks, uh, you know, we've lived through crises before. This looks like probably a little bigger than what we've seen before, but uh, uh, we'll figure out a way through it. And uh, uh, may hurt a little bit, but uh, I'm sure we'll come out the other side. I'm Dominique Fox, and I work for WH Pacific. It's an NL owned company. I'm a shareholder. Um, I'm here as a guest uh, to William Hill Hensley. Um, what, I left, what I took away from last night's presentation is um, I have some rental properties, and I was wondering <laughs> if I could sell. <laughs> Tomorrow, yesterday, uh, so. yesterday. Oh. And then I had a dream, and I was <coughs> tripping in my dream, and um, I had some roof leaks, and it was raining pretty hard, and I refused to get them repaired because I wanted to keep my money in the bank. <laughs> so, but that's all. That's all I've got. So. <laughs> I'm Jennifer oh, John. I am um, taking. I'm in the MPA program as well, and right. I'm a chiropractor over at South Central. <laughs> and so, um, yesterday was. It was new information. I um, I still am pretty hopeful about the future. So, yeah, so but it was interesting to hear. Mm -hmm. Good morning. My name is Wayne Wayne Westlake. I'm uh, a guest of Willie as as she is. I didn't attend last night's presentation. Okay. We'll go to the back row. Uh, I'm Peter Jansen, investment geek for uh, charitable foundation. <laughs> and do investments uh, in oil and gas outside on occasion in partnership formats. So it will be interesting to hear. Yeah. I'm Rajpreet Prasad, I'm dean of the College of, me, College of Business and Public Policy. And I didn't listen to the presentation last night because I had to attend two events, which I'll mention just by way of context. One was a um, mid-year get-together of our leadership fellows. We have a mentoring program where uh, executives in the community mentor uh, our current students through a selective process. The other place was the celebration of the first anniversary of The Boardroom, uh, which is a, oh. a company started by two of our graduates. Right. And uh, um, it felt like a little bit of the Bay Area there. Very cool. I felt <laughs> a little out of place. <laughs> While we're, you know, yeah. so I'm keeping that in the back of my mind while we're looking forward to listening to you, to the, to the sort of deep and, um, and ponderous uh, issues that have already been presented. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, 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 oh, well, well, sorry. Oh, hi. I'm Steve Conkle. Right. I'm an associate professor in the College of Health. And I take this, take this class multiple times because I'm not that bright, but I always <laughs> learn something every session. <laughs> and as far as takeaways from last night, um, I um, managed to uh, talk with somebody that had a big interest in economic development and the Anchorage figures. And it reminded me when I was at Oak Ridge National Laboratory as an energy economist, how they used to joke about economists as um, on the one hand and on the other hand, because there were, you know, actually, Many this hands. is what the evidence tells us. And um, so it was an interesting discussion when we're talking <coughs> about projections of Alaska's future um, and all of the uncertainty that's involved in there and how important that is as a base of knowledge to go on and get into breaking groups and discuss what the issues are and what success looks like. So once again, it, it made me appreciate my background <coughs> in environmental economics. Um, and I didn't think that there's one path forward, but there's room for lots of voices. And uh, so it's great having such an eminent panel to talk about it, I thought. And I don't think the discussion's over by any means. I think every iteration will learn a little bit more, and then maybe we'll get more evidence. Well, thank you very much for, for sharing your thoughts. I, I, I sense that from, for many of you, there's some new information here, but maybe not total surprises. Um, there's this concern, anxiety. Uh, there's a surprising. Good, I'm, I'm glad there's lots of optimism. That you know, one way, even from the old timers who've gone through, as everybody who raised their hand last night did, uh, the the uh, re that recession we had in the in the uh, late 80s. Um, we are going to talk about 
the context of last night, of course, was that a new administration is trying to set, get a sense of the economic environment that it will live in as the administers of a state budget. So that presentation you saw from Brad last night and others was pretty well focusing in on state, the state revenues. There's other parts of the economy, of course, and we'll talk about that and how that may differ from what the state itself is facing. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to turn to Brad, who's going to catch the next part of this presentation and give us some, some background and where we are today. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about leading up to, to the, the situation we find ourselves in today. Uh, we have been, we've been heading here for a while. Uh, Scott's been publishing papers since 2010 that talks about uh, the, the coming uh, situation. And Susan, to respond to your question about what's different this time, the state's cost structure has become very different. If we've got the right slide up, oh, we do. If we've got the right slide up, the, the chart at the right is a graph of state spending uh, over the last decade. And if you go back uh, before where that chart starts, um, spending is lower uh, than, it, than it was uh, this period. To, to come off the top of my head, during the Knowles administration, if I recall correctly, uh, we were somewhere in the range of $2 billion a year in state spending. That's capital and operating combined on the UGFs, on the unrestricted general funds side. Uh, in Frank's administration, in Murkowski's administration, we got somewhere in the 3.5 to 4 billion range. Um, in the Palin administration, we got to 5 billion. And in the Parnell administration, we've averaged 6.5 billion. Uh, and we hit a high of 7.9 billion um, uh, in um, fiscal year 2012, 2012. So the state's cost structure has hugely increased uh, in the last five years, which has made us extremely vulnerable to oil price shifts in a way that we haven't been historic, that we haven't been as much historically. To give you another way of that, one of the ways that oil uh, economists and oil analysts think about uh, the exposure of companies and the exposure of countries to oil price risk and to oil, pr and, well, to oil price risk, you think about what the break-even price is in your budget or the break-even price in your company, what, what, how much you can stand oil prices going down before you start losing money. Um, Alaska ranks the third highest in the world in terms of break-even price. Iran is around $140 a barrel. Uh, Venezuela is around $125 a barrel. Alaska is around $120 a barrel. Russia is around $113, $114 a barrel. You go all the way down to Saudi, which is roughly in the range of $80 a barrel, $85 a barrel. Texas is roughly in the range of $80 a barrel. And then you can go on down into some of the other countries in the Middle East. There are countries, Nigeria, other countries are, are in that, or somewhere in that range. Some are higher, some are lower. But Alaska has allowed over the last five years, particularly its cost structure to, to just increase rapidly. We've just spent money after money after money on a variety of projects. And you can see the, the hill that we've created uh, in terms of spending. So what's different is we have exposed ourselves to, pricing, to price risk at a, at a level that, that we weren't uh, in the 80s and, and that we weren't in the 90s. Uh, and, and, and as a consequence, movements in price like we're seeing here uh, really open up a, a problem for us in a way that they don't for a lot of other countries and the way they don't for a lot of companies. I mean, BP, uh, BP's break-even price is $80 or their budget price is $80, not in Alaska globally. So th they don't start feeling you know, significant pain until prices get down to that level. We start feeling significant pain at the $117, $120 uh, dollar level. So that's, that's what's different. Brad, could you also talk about the impact of, uh, comparative impacts of volume then it, versus now? And yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in the problems of the 80s, uh, or in the situation we faced in the 80s, we still had huge volumes. So. When price came down, uh, we had a problem, but when, as price recovered, we had a lot of volumes that generated a lot of revenue quickly as price came back up. Uh, from a relative standpoint, we're, our volumes are down now. We're down to about 500,000. We were in the million plus range in the 80s. And a half even. Oh, close to two. Close to two in yeah. the 80s. So when, when 
when price moved in the 80s, when price started finally going back up in the 80s, our revenues moved fairly quickly because we had the volumes over which to recover. Now we don't have those volumes. But, but the biggest immediate problem uh, to me is cost structure. We've just let the cost structure get way out of hand uh, and, and are just not positioned to be able to ride uh, these, these sorts of price changes. As I said, uh, people have been identifying this problem for uh, a few years. Uh, the, the problem really started um, with the FY uh, 2011 budget. I think that's right. It's either FY 2011 or FY 2012. We went from roughly $5.47 billion in spending. Uh, in one year, we jumped from 5.47 to 7. The next year, we jumped to 7.9. Uh, the year after that, we came back down to 7.2, and now we're back down to 6.2 billion. Uh, but this problem has, has come on fairly, fairly quickly, um, and, uh, and people picked up on it and started talking about it. Scott started talking about it. In 2013, is that the next slide? Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. In 2013, uh, ICER published a paper that said, right now the state is on a path it can't sustain. Growing spending and falling revenues are creating a widening fiscal gap. Reasonable assumptions about potential new revenue sources suggest we do not have enough cash and reserves to avoid a severe fiscal crunch soon after 2023, and with that fiscal crisis will come an economic crash. Um, and the chart that you see on the right, or the two charts on the right, they're in sequential fiscal years, are charts of state spending, which is the black line at the top, and then various revenue sources uh, are in the skins, the colored skins down below. Um, oil uh, is, is the, well, the non-oil revenue, which is about 500 million a year, is at the very bottom, the brown line. Uh, and then oil is on top of that. New oil is the light green line. And then on top of that was some gas projections that ICER made of gas. The red, so you can see the, 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 the spread between those colored skins and the spending line as early as, 20, as FY 2013, the red was the use of state savings to fill in the gap from the constitutional budget reserve and the, strategic and the, and the statutory budget reserve to fill in the gap for several years. But it showed, as the, as the analysis indicated, at 2023, we ran out of savings. And once we ran out of savings, there was really, there's really no place to go but, but a crash in terms, of, in, terms of, uh, in terms of what the state can do in terms of spending. So we saw that coming in 2013, indicated that, that we had about a decade out. We were facing that in 2023. In 2014, um, ICER did another analysis, but this time legislative finance, which is a division of the state legislature, uh, did the same analysis, uh, did their own analysis, and came to the same conclusion. The implications of the, of the figures are severe. Uh, 0.2 failure to reduce the projected deficits will result in a very hard landing. These charts are our alleged finances way of depicting the situation. The chart, the upper chart, is, uh, is spending on, on the upper line, the red line, revenues on the lower line, the blue line, uh, which we used, uh, which we used savings to, uh, to fill that gap. And the bottom chart is the decline in savings uh, over time as we use savings to fill in the gap between spending and, and, uh, and revenues. Um, and it showed, that chart showed also uh, depleting the savings in 2023 and hitting the fiscal gap in 2023. So up until the last, 2013 and 2014, we, were, we, were, we saw this problem coming, uh, but we saw this problem being fairly not far off, decades not far in terms of fiscal structure, but, but within a time frame that we had time to respond. And then, and then this happened. Um, and this is the oil price drop. And what the oil price drop has done is has accelerated the track we were on uh, uh, that ICER and Ledge Finance were seeing uh, two years ago, three years, four years ago. It's accelerated that track. Oil revenues are the product of two things. They're, they're the products of production and, the, and, the, and, the, 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 and price. Um, and what we were seeing, what ICER and uh, Ledge Finance were seeing was the decline in production and the decline in revenue as a result of the decline in production. When price dropped, revenue dropped. So it, what, what we were seeing was going to be a, the result of production drop has now occurred as a result of price drop, and it's occurred immediately. The, um, uh, the price drop has been, has been dramatic 
the January price that we've got up there, the ANS price is 105 bucks a barrel. March was 111, May was 105. We did the budget, the 2015 budget, based upon a break-even price of $117, assuming that price was going to stay up. Um, and in July and August, it was relatively high, 111 and 103, but then it broke. Uh, September 1, uh, $97 a barrel. October 1, $91 a barrel. Uh, November 1, $82 a barrel. And the price, the, uh, the time I did, the last time I did the slide deck, which was Thursday, I think, it was $75. I think yesterday it bounced all the way back up to $77. Um, so, but the, the, we'll come on to a slide that will talk about this in greater detail, but while at the beginning of this price slide, uh, people thought that the, the, the analysis was that it might be a bounce and that it was going to go down and then it might come back up. As, as, as the analysts have understood the reasons for the price decline, uh, the general consensus now is that it's staying down for a period of time, that there's been a fundamental shift in the supply-demand curve. Uh, as a result of several factors that Scott will talk about, okay. uh, and that price is going to stay down. I'm going to ask Scott to sort of pick up on. Can I have the clicker? <laughs> I'll just push the button for you. Well, I, I may want to. Oh, you want a point? Well. The pointer, yeah, all right. Point and click. It doesn't. The click <laughs> doesn't work. But I do. Oh, the click doesn't work. I'm the clicker. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you have questions, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> go ahead and ask them. Let's not wait till the end yeah. to ask questions because. Uh, you may forget, and we may forget the answers. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I actually have a question. Yes. Before you start, uh, uh, Brad, uh, well, you, Scott has been working these numbers for years and years, but I think the, the public has not really been focused on, on this subject, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it, it sort of came to me back in about 2009 down in southeast Alaska, and uh, I began to think about, you know, why, why is it that, because this issue is going to affect every man, woman, and child, and every entity that uses state funds, and that's a lot of entities, mm -hmm. uh, so could you talk about the, the nature of the obligation of public servants to talk about issues of this magnitude? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. for planning purposes, like this young lady here, I mean, people have, it's going to affect their lives, you know, if things don't go right. And so, the, to me, there's a planning aspect to it that's uh, been uh, ignored, uh, in part because public servants sort of have ignored this. It's back to the end of our presentation. Yeah, so, so we'll come on to this in, in, in a little bit in, in a little bit later. But what we've had, in my opinion, and I'm sure the three of us may have different opinions on that, what we've had in this state is people who want to get elected. Uh, and the way you get elected is by delivering goods back home, by, by delivering state services back home. And they've had the money to do it. I mean, if you go back to, if you go back to the hill, back to two, three for just a second, uh, in the early stages of that spending curve, we had revenues. I mean, it, we passed ACES in 2006, 2007, 2007. Um, oil prices jumped in 2007 and 2008. State revenues went, went way up. And so people thought that was going to last forever. And they started, they started making commitments and started spending things, started agreeing to programs. On the Medicaid side, for example, we, we've opted into more optional Medicaid services in this state than any other state in the nation. Uh, we, we, have, we have just done a number of things that have increased our cost structure based upon the assumption that things are in line. And, and, and we have elected officials and they wanted to please their public and they wanted to deliver goods and services. They wanted to deliver a nice new sports arena. Mm. They wanted to deliver AstroTurf on football fields. They wanted to deliver new football stadiums at every high school in Anchorage and, and, and spreading out to the state. They wanted to deliver a nice aquatic center out in Bethel. They wanted to deliver a nice baseball field in Sitka. It goes, it, the list goes on and on and on. So they, they, they wanted to say yes. They get reelected by saying yes. And, and they have not, 
they've not been cautious about what the forecast is and, what, and what's happening to the state. We, um, with Scott's uh, stuff, with Scott's uh, reports on sustainability, some have gotten a little bit more cautious, but the general consensus has been that they wanted to continue to say yes, my opinion. We'll talk a little bit later in the, toward the end of the presentation about some suggestions <coughs> we have of how to address uh, getting this information out publicly and have it in the public's mind all the time. Susan. I thought your suggestions last night, Brad, to that point, the communications point, were really spot on. Are you going to talk about the possibility of an income tax and whether this would actually lead our legislative leaders to propose such a thing? Stand by. <laughs> <laughs> Scott's going to talk about income tax. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think that another problem that we've faced is that uh, in, in trying to get the, the public to recognize this uh, challenge and to, and to put pressure on our uh, leaders to uh, act is that it's, it's really a, a, a systemic or a structural problem that we face. And it's been a problem since we began um, collecting revenues from Prudhoe Bay because the, the Prudhoe Bay field is the largest field ever discovered in North America. And right next to it is Kaparik, which I believe is the second largest. And these are one-off fields. We can't expect that we're going to find another Prudhoe Bay or Kaparik um, in the future. And so, um, it was recognized at the beginning that uh, the, the revenues and the wealth that would be generated from uh, production of Prudhoe Bay would be a one-time event. And that after Prudhoe Bay um, was all produced, uh, there, wouldn't be a, there wouldn't be a second Prudhoe Bay to, to continue the sort of part, party at the level that uh, we would like. And so, uh, um, it was a, there was a recognition that, that we had to uh, husband this resource if it was going to last beyond the, the time when, uh, when production would decline. And um, you know, that's, that's easier said than done. We, we did some brilliant things early on, the most important one being uh, the creation of the permanent fund, which is an attempt to take that um, non-renewable resource and convert it, at least a part of it, into a renewable resource, to take a, a non-renewable non uh, natural resource and convert it into a sustainable, renewable financial resource. But, but uh, that's, it's a problem that, that we've been facing since uh, Prudhoe Bay started production. and. Uh, We've, we've recognized that it's a problem, but uh, it's one, well, we can, we can worry about that tomorrow. We've got more pressing concerns that we have to deal with today. And uh, so uh, when, when times are relatively flush, we, we've tended to, to uh, postpone dealing with, with this problem. Uh, there have been a couple times in the past when the problem has raised its, its uh, ugly head. Uh, in the mid-80s, there was a price crash. And um, <clears throat> then again, uh, around 2000, 2001, 2002, there wasn't a, so much of a price crash as a price weakness. And uh, um, both of those times, we, we were um, faced with, with the same kind of problem we, we have today, but, uh, and, and I, I think <coughs> that Brad has, has mentioned a couple things that are different today. I think there's a third thing that's different today, and that is that, and this is, I, historically I've been sort of Captain Bringdown on this, but, but um, <laughs> bring down I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic today than I have been in the past, and the reason I am is because we have uh, financial resources in the bank today, as we sit here, of about $60 billion. 
you know, that's significant amount of money. We didn't have that back in the mid 80s. We had a couple billion dollars in the permanent fund. We didn't have that in the early 2000s. We may, maybe had 25 billion in the permanent fund. Not insignificant, but nothing like we have today. So at the same time that, that our uh, uh, spending has increased, in a sense, uh, our financial assets have increased, and so we have more capability to deal with the, uh, the challenge that we face today than we did back uh, either 10 years ago or 25 years ago. And, and the second thing is that, that even though the uh, amount of production is down, the value of that production, even at $75 a barrel, is a lot higher than the value of production was back uh, in 2000, for example, when the price was about $25. So but, we do have things going for us. Uh, but we've consumed it with spending. We are we've, consuming we've, it with spending, that's, that's true. Can so. I make just one point? I hate to put a wet blanket over this, but I mean, just we're talking about spending and having kind of a mindset of savings. Just for instance, I mean, we're sitting here, you know, there's about maybe about 200 Alaskans right now from all across the state who have been brought in for this conference, right? And probably it's going to cost 150 to $200,000 probably total. And everybody thinks, I mean, that's probably important, but everybody thinks that their projects are important. <laughs> you know, everybody believes that. So I'm just, you know, this is just one example of where, you know, where state spending is going, right? We all think this is important. And with a legislator who wants AstroTurf for their schools thinks that's important, too. It might think that that would be more important than spending $200,000 in this conference. So just an example, just a little aside there. Okay, so. Back to our slides. Can, can everybody see these? Okay. So uh, where are we today in terms of our um, <clears throat> fiscal situation? Uh, if, if the price of oil uh, in the fiscal year that we're uh, going to be entering into uh, July 1st, that was fiscal year 2016, uh, averages about $85 a barrel. Um, <clears throat> We're going to run out, and, and if we continue on the current path, the path that we're on in our uh, spending, then our easy to reach financial resources are going to run out in three years. And that's, the, that's what you see in the red there. We've got in the bank, we will have in the bank starting in fiscal year 2016, in our two easy to access accounts. That the CBR, which is the Constitutional Budget Reserve, and the SBR, the Statutory Budget Reserve, about $10 billion, okay? At $3 billion a year, you know, we run through that pretty quickly, okay? And if the price of, of oil is a little bit higher, then it takes a little bit longer to run through those cash resources but uh, not very much longer. If the price is as high as $100, or averages $100 a barrel, then uh, we'll have some money in the bank in those easy to reach accounts until about 2021. And this, this is a very different picture than, than we were looking, in terms of how long we have before those accounts run out, uh, than we were looking at uh, just six months ago. So six months ago, it looked like, well, maybe we can make it to 2023 or even 2024 before those uh, cash accounts are uh, em empty. Um, the 55 or 60 billion we have sitting in the PFD, uh, that's generating some amount of money for the state, right? Just the investments of the PFD. Something like today, I'm not sure if I heard correctly, how much a year? Mm -hmm. uh, like five, yeah, five. we'll come back to that, but uh, in, in an average year, well, the, the Permanent Fund Corporation manages the fund with a target real rate of return of 5%. And where does that money get put? Back into the Permanent Fund or another pot of Okay. The, <laughs> the, the basic question. Yeah, it is, it is a basic question. The, the earnings of the Permanent Fund are available for appropriation by the legislature. The corpus of the permanent fund is protected by the Constitutional. It cannot 
Constitution cannot be spent. What happens to the earnings currently? Currently, there, there are uh, two formulas for uh, allocating a portion of the earnings of the permanent fund. The first formula allocates a portion of the earnings to the permanent fund dividend each year. About one half of the earnings each year goes to pay the dividend. In a, in a year when the fund hits its target, 5% real rate of return, uh, and if the inflation is about 25 or 3% a year, which is what it's been running average historically, then about 4% of the earnings of the permanent fund, the nominal earnings, goes to pay the dividend. In today's world, when the permanent fund has $50 billion in it, five to, it will generate about $4 billion in nominal earnings, and about half of that will go to pay uh, into the dividend account. Okay. The second part, the second formula calculates inflation proofing. Okay. Inflation proofing is taking part of the earnings from the permanent fund and putting it into the corpus to uh, conserve the purchasing pow power value of the corpus. Because otherwise, the corpus would lose value over time due to inflation. That $50 billion would get smaller in real terms. Okay. So that's the second thing. After that's done, there's some money left over, maybe a billion dollars or a billion and a half dollars. That just sort of sits on the table. It's available for appropriation. But historically, we haven't appropriated any, any of that money. We've done two things with it. One, we've just let it sit, and the Permanent Fund Corporation has put it into a separate account which sort of protects it. People don't realize it's there, so in a sense that protects it from being spent. But it is available for appropriation. A few times in the past, the legislature has put some of that money back into the corpus of the fund to increase the size of the corpus and to protect it from being appropriated by future legislators. Currently, there's about uh, five to six billion dollars sitting in that uh, what's called the undistributed earnings account. That's available for appropriations. If that money is spent, uh, it, it's a little harder to get to than the CBR or the SBR because it not, not um, uh, statutorily, but just because it's sort of falls under the, um, the guidelines of the permanent fund. And in fact, if that money were to be spent, it would uh, negatively impact the size of uh, future dividends. That's a, that's a long explanation of, of uh, what, that, uh, what happens to the earnings and, and where they sit today. But uh, it's important to understand that. Could you explain also where the uh, CBR and the SBR come from? The SBR was created, um, I think it was the SBR, <laughs> it was created back, uh, oh, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and now my mind is going bank blank on exactly, <laughs> well, uh, without getting into too much detail, both the CBR and the SBR uh, were created to provide some year-to-year uh, -year stability in um, our uh, spending capacity in recognition of the fact that oil prices uh, fluctuate dramatically from year to year and uh, we don't want, want expenditures to be jacked around by, by that to, uh, any more than need to be. What, what we did was to, to fund the, the SBR and the CBR essentially from um, uh, settlements 
between the, the state and the oil industry over uh, disputes about back taxes and, and back royalties. And most of, the, most of that money was put into the CBR in the late 80s and the early 90s, as I recall. Although we've still been adding to it a little bit uh, into the CBR, a little bit each year. But, but most of the money that's gone into those accounts uh, uh, went in five or ten years ago. So where was I? Yes. Uh, <coughs> so that, this is the current picture of uh, how long our cash, res cash reserves, the, the CBR and the SBR, but not the earnings reserve of the permanent fund, uh, will last if we uh, continue on our current path in terms of spending, in terms of uh, the revenues that we uh, generate each year. And uh, there are a number of different ways to, to think about this. Three or four of them are, are listed here. Um, I heard these last night. I'll, I'll move ahead on the next slide. Yeah. And, and um, you know, <coughs> so the, a question that, that comes to mind uh, immediately is, well, are oil prices going to stay as low as they are today? Are they going to get lower? Uh, when are they going to bo bounce back? And uh, as Brad has already alluded to, um, the, the drop has been pretty dramatic in the last four months, and uh, the, the dust seems to be clearing a little bit now, now in terms of how people who think about these, these issues of uh, oil markets um, <clears throat> are interpreting what's happening. And, and here are just three uh, quotes from three different types of agencies about uh, where, where, they, where their th current thinking is about what, uh, what prices are going to look like in the future. The first one is the U.S. government, the federal government, the Energy Information Agency. Uh, Brent crude oil prices, which are essentially the same as uh, ANS, Alaska North Slope. Average 83 in 2015, uh, considerably lower than um, the forecast just a month previous. The IEA is an international organization that follows oil markets. Um, you can read what they're saying. I don't need to. Uh, I don't need to read it. Um, but they they do um, say that we seem to be entering a new chapter in the history of oil markets. And Capital Economics is a private firm that follows world oil markets and. Uh, they also say we believe that oil, lower oil prices are here to stay. Um, it's really t impossible to forecast oil prices. Um, you know, they go up and down. In the last five years, I think we've seen oil prices at $40. We've seen oil prices at $150. So there's a lots, lots of variability. Um, forecasters tend to take the current price and sort of Somebody mentioned linear forecasting out here, uh, I think, this morning. We, we tend to do that. It's really hard to get away from that. But we, we do need to recognize that uh, there is uh, variability in oil prices going forward, and there's a lot of uncertainty. And if we... But before we go, the reason that you're seeing these pronouncements has to do with a, a lot of the economics and the geopolitics of, of oil. Um, there's a lot of production right now. In, the, in North America, we've had tremendous growth in production of, of, of the tight oils. And globally, meanwhile, we have a bit of a recession going on, particularly in Europe. And you put those two things together, and all of a sudden we have a, a growing imbalance between the supply and the demand. And on top of that, you've got Saudi Arabia losing market share, particularly in the United States, and wanting to regain that. So they're no longer, at least at, at the moment, we'll see what happens next week, uh, willing to be the swing uh, volume player, in other words, to cut the production back. So they're, <coughs> the thinking is they're letting it slide down to a point where it will begin to shut off production. 
in particular areas like North Dakota and the, Rock, the, the expensive places. And in fact, um, it is having some effect like that already. I looked at some numbers that came in just this week, and some of the new permitting in North Dakota has, has, has slowed down rather quickly. But how long does it take, once a well is in production, for that to go down and find ourselves in balance? And I think the thinking around here is that there's probably a couple of years of prices in the range we're talking about, but anything one that talks beyond two years from now, it's it's a bit hard to tell. The farther out you go, the less less certain. Peter, you had. Uh, I think from uh, going and sitting in meetings with the guys who do new oil, and, new oil and gas investments from time to time, a lot of them pay attention to this guy Pickering, the beautiful Pickering, he broadcast prices, and the way the companies will look at it a lot of times in terms of what they can budget. Yeah, you know, this is smaller companies, not big companies, right? Uh, but other people going in could like do the jails and things like that. And the, the, his price deck was, gee, I think when you're going to slide all around sides of this is 80 to 100 bucks the next five, six years. He made that forecast six years ago too. And I, I heard mm -hmm. the same guy do it for a decade. And it's basically a lower than 80 stuff gets shut in and the oil sands and things like that that are expensive become less economic. The decline rates in shales are very, very rapid, you know, in terms of they produce right. a lot, they run off real they quick, it's not like a big barrel like Bruno. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most all the production increase in the world has been U.S. in the last, you know, five, ten years. That, and so we, and that was one that nobody forecast. So I guess like Mr. Roderick, perhaps there's, you know, some other stuff out there to be found. I don't know. but. Uh, uh, that that was interesting from hearing how they advise companies, you know, forecast for their capital. And obviously, if they're wrong, the companies go away; they go broke. You know, no matter how much uh, you want that to happen. Jack, hey, hey, you thank, guys, you, thank you, thank you, Peter. Economists up there. Alaska can't do anything about the world price of oil. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What are we doing to ourselves? We're we, we're we're softening our brain, or what? Mm -hmm. what, what, what? What difference is it make? We can't affect the price of oil. Of course not. No, we cannot. <clears throat> no, we, we can't afford, affect the price of oil, and so that, that's why I argue we, we shouldn't be so concerned about what the price of oil is today. We should plan for the fact that whatever the price of oil is today, it won't be the price tomorrow. Okay. How do we deal with that as a state? Next slide. So what I'm hearing from last night and today is if Alaska continues spending the way we are currently spending, right. we're going to hit a, a recession and there's going to be a major economic crash. So what do we do now and until 2023 to prevent that from happening? Right. We're yeah. going to get there in a yeah, moment. We'll, we'll get there in a okay. couple of but a lot, is there in fact going to be a, will, will state funding it's all by itself cause an economic uh, crash, if you will? And that was a question you were having, that was the call my daughter gave me this morning. And she's in the oil business. So I think that takes us to the next slide here. Mm -hmm. and, um, Brad, you want to talk about the uh, difference between, or Scott, the this difference Scott. between the effect on the oil business That's as Scott. compared, Scott, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I, I think Brad has already touched on this point, and, and uh, I forget what he called it, the break-even price or, or whatever. The, the, the state of Alaska has gotten itself in a position where the, its break-even price for oil is $117 a barrel, which is we're seeing at least this fiscal year and next fiscal year is crazy because the, the, we'll, at actual prices, anticipated prices, we'll be running def, deficits of $3 billion a year, which is 50% of the size of the budget. So we'll be generating $3 billion in revenues and we'll be drawing $3 billion out of our savings account. That's a crazy situation. Um, most oil companies that I'm familiar with, and, and uh, Brad will support me on this, I'm, I'm sure, is that they take a, a more conservative approach in terms of planning their future uh, 
investments in their current activities, and that is a break-even point that may be 75, 80, 85 dollars a barrel, what have you. And uh, the bottom line is that when the price goes down, the state get financial situation uh, gets squeezed, but the uh, oil industry uh, doesn't suffer nearly as much. And uh, I, I think that's another difference. I would argue between what we're seeing today and, and what the situation was back in the mid 1980s. Right. In the mid 1980s, the price went from $35 a barrel down to seven or nine dollars yes. a barrel virtually overnight, and it really caught the industry by surprise as well as I, I think to a larger extent than is true today. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and and and, and, and it, it was a, a much larger drop as well. And so what we saw in terms of the Alaska economy was. Uh, a contraction in government and a contraction in our largest private sector industry, and that's what led to the big recession that we had back then when we lost 10% of the population. Half the banks in the state uh, went belly up, and um, it was not a, and, and the value of your house, the price of your house went through the toilet, and if you lived in a condominium, your condominium was worth like 10 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> True. So I, th I think that that gets to uh, that important point. I mean, I take that as a positive. Yes, it is. As long as it, we have oil prices in the vicinity of eighty or something, the oil industry in Alaska still is viable. It's profitable. It, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see shrinkages in employment there. So that sector, to those who, who like my daughter, who are working in the fields, they. That's generally positive news. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to move out of state yet. Yeah. Um, if anything, the state should be assisting the oil companies to lower that price where, you know, where possible, right? I mean, as long as it doesn't affect their side of the budget. Yeah. That's, and that's the challenge. Yeah. Tax and revenue structures, though. Yeah. Right. That notwithstanding, we have to recognize how important state government spending is to the health of the economy. Six billion dollars, which is the current size of the uh, general fund state budget, being pumped into the economy each year is a tremendous boost, or it's a you know, tremendous boost to the economy uh, in every community in the state. And uh, when uh, the state budget gets a cold, then every community in the state gets gets sick as every, every community is affected. So let's move on to the next, yeah. next slide. Uh, oh, OK. So uh, we've talked about how, uh, how important oil prices are to future state revenues and that we can't influence those. The same is true of LNG prices. What other variables should we be thinking about? When we, uh, when we think about what future state revenues may be, recognizing again that 90 to 95 percent of our revenue base currently comes from oil and gas. So that's, uh, that's where the action is. Well, the key variables that we can have some influence on, we can't control them, obviously, we can have some influence on through policies of state government and how we influence the federal government are changes in the oil production curve on the North Slope, uh, <coughs> the development of new, new types of oil on state lands or in new locations and uh, uh, oil that's, that's harder to get out of the ground, oil that hasn't yet been discovered. Uh, obviously, uh, um, LNG, commercializing our LNG resource, and then uh, developing our oil resources on federal lands in the National uh, Petroleum Reserve, which we're actually starting to do now as the oil companies are working their way, way east, uh, westward on the North Slope. Um, the uh, resources on the Outer Continental Shelf and uh, the potential resources in ANWR. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that 
the revenues from federal lands are less to the state on a per barrel basis than revenues on state lands because we have to share the royalties, which is one of the two big sources of revenues from oil production. We have to share the royalties with the federal government. Oil on state lands, we, we as a state, collect all the royalties. Uh, in NPRA and ANWR, we, the split is uh, maybe 50-50. That, that's always subject to continuing negotiation. Royalties and the OCS, which is um, land, uh, the OCS, Outer Continental Shelf, land more than three miles offshore. Current, under current law, federal law, the federal government gets all the royalties. We don't get anything. It's a different situation than in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> That's something we should be working on <laughs> to get our share, our fair share of the royalties, if you will. But the other thing about OCS is we don't get any of the production tax. We don't get any production tax revenues either because it's, it's on federal lands. We can't tax on federal lands. So the two biggest source of rev sources of revenue, the production tax and the royalties, we get a smaller share of anything that is produced on federal lands, and particularly in the OCS. Under current law, we get virtually nothing. So nothing in terms of revenues. We get a lot in terms of jobs, business opportunities, economic activity. And of course, if we had an income tax, a personal income tax, we would collect revenues from the wages and salaries earned by those workers. Which we don't. <laughs> but we don't. Okay, so uh, with, with that background, let's take a look uh, of what the future might look like under three different sets of assumptions about future revenues from petroleum. In light, uh, also assuming that we continued on the same spending path that we are today. And there's quite, a, there's quite a range. If we, if we hit the trifecta, everybody knows what a trifecta is. That, that's basically, uh, you win on all your bets, right? <laughs> if, the, if the price of oil jumps back to 105 bucks, if the, if the decline rate in production, which historically has been running about 5%, slows to 2%, and we, we get oil from uh, these new sources, viscous heavy oil, significant oil, from NPRA, from uh, yet to be discovered conventional oil, and we get the, LA, we get the gas pipeline at, uh, at, <coughs> at a low cost so that the, the uh, revenues that we can generate off of that are high. There's been talk of $4 billion a year in revenues from LNG. Well, if that comes comes to pass, that might be equivalent to uh, $3.50 per MCF. MCF is a million cubic feet. It's a standard measure of volume of gas. And the OCS comes online, and we get some federal revenue sharing, and ANWR is opened up, and, uh, and uh, we start to get significant production from ANWR within a decade. Then things, uh, things look pretty good. Uh, in terms of being able to, to sustain a budget, we would be able to sustain a budget growing out into, into the future years from a level of about what we are today. Actually a little bit higher, $6.5 billion. And whoops, go back, go back, go back. <laughs> uh, looking at this, this little graph of what what the future uh, of the unrestricted general fund, which of course is, is the main f fund that um, the fund state, state government uh, <coughs> spending. This is uh, non-petroleum revenues. This is existing uh, petroleum revenues. This again is the, the red is the use of our uh, cash accounts. And, and this is new, uh, new oil from, from ANWR and the OCS and other new sources, and this is a gas line. And you can see that um, compared to the black line of spending, 
uh, we're in pretty good shape. There's just, uh, just a little bump in the road here in the late part of this decade, but when the gas line comes along, it saves us. So this is, this is the positive picture. This is the picture we'd all like to see, right? Which, which, was which line was spending, did you say spending would? Spending is the dark, uh, <coughs> is the black line. Okay, so the assumption allows for increase in spending. It does allow for an increase, but uh, only with inflation and with population. Okay. So it's constant in terms of per so capita real Purchasing spending. power. Yeah, uh, purchasing power. Okay. Ready for the next one? Ready for the next one, okay. Uh, well, uh, let's consider uh, a case that's not quite so optimistic. Uh, $90 oil, 3% uh, production decline rate, and uh, uh, we, can, we do get a gas line, but it doesn't generate the kinds of revenue we've been hearing about uh, over the last several months, and uh, we don't get the, uh, production from the OCS or ANWR. Well, then we can, under those assumptions, calculate that we'd have uh, sustainable spending if we started out today at four and a half billion dollars a year instead of the six and a half that uh, we looked at in the last uh, slide. And you can see that um, in this case we run through our cash reserves pretty quickly and um, there's quite a big bump in the road before the gas line comes along and uh, new sources of oil uh, production, and they're, they're not nearly enough to close that gap, okay? Uh, one of the estimates uh, that I've seen, and I don't know that much about the large diameter and gas pipeline, is 45 to $65 billion. Yes. And um, is there, looking at capital projects or large projects, is there any way of uh, kind of projecting whether that's a, a realistic range and that's going to, you know, basically return the kind of revenues in the previous uh, uh, scenario, like the trifecta or this one, or if we can, uh, you know, expect like some hydro projects, they end up being a, an awful lot more expensive than we first think they're going to be. Well, th those of you who have been around for a while know that we've been talking about a gas line for at least 35, 40 years now. Mm -hmm. And, the, of course, the price always has been going up. Yeah. And um, the real challenge is to keep the price below what, the price per MCF produced below what the value or the sale, the, the sale price would be at the market. And um, there's, there's, as there is with oil, an incredible amount of uncertainty going forward as to what the uh, market will be able to support in terms of a price of LNG and what the uh, supply cost of LNG will be. And um, because of that uncertainty, there's an incredible amount of uncertainty and range as to what future revenues to the state might be from uh, development of our gas resources. The next slide. Yeah. Uh, the next slide, yeah, let's, let's go to the low case. The low case is, um, I would say, fairly pessimistic. Eight, $80 oil from now on, a 5% production decline rate, which is uh, as what we've had in the past, and really, uh, uh, not much new oil and gas development going on in the state and no LNG um, and no OCS and no ANWR. And under those pessimistic assumptions, we're looking at a level of uh, spending for the unrestricted general fund that we could sustain over long periods of time of about two and three quarters billion dollars, which is less than less than half of what we are spending today and if you look at the graphic you can, you can see that uh, the cash reserve runs out uh, in three three fiscal years and um, then we're really facing a, a world of hurt in terms of where does the money come from or our challenge I'd say where's the money come from to uh, pay for that rate of growth of spending 
So Scott, under the, a middle or a, a pessimistic scenario, to make it work, graphically speaking, we need to bring the starting line down here. Is that the idea? You bring the starting line down so that this piece fills in the, the gap there and then we then move up ahead? Yeah. Thinking about this graphic, there's two things you can do to get rid of this area. One is you can bring the, the line of spending down, and the other is you can find additional um, areas of revenues to bring the revenue area up. It's as simple as that. Okay. Okay. So what are the alternatives, Ira? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're gonna, this, this is the next section we had our five sections that are called what the, what are the alternatives and we started to spell out some of those uh, now um, and as, as you can see by um, if we don't hit the trifecta anything less than the trifecta anything less than perfect bets we find ourselves uh, needing one needing one or more of the following and, I, and you've all heard this you've already thought about this obviously number one reducing expenditures. <laughs> Second, instituting a broad-based tax. This is a quote, by the way, not, not something we made up. This is from Northern Economics that came out in 2011. This is not even new thinking. Instituting a broad-based tax, and that could be anything from an income tax to a sales tax, for example. There's a whole range of possibilities there. Lots of different versions on income taxes and sales tax. Peter and I have had some interesting conversations about what he's got in mind. Um, and a use of a portion, it says and use, not or, and use of a portion of the earnings of the permanent fund. Earnings being what you heard earlier are what would uh, pay for your, your dividend and also help to inflation proof the fund. So this is uh, all three being called into, into, into play here. Um, this is my part. I get to talk about inaction is not an option. <laughs> Uh, it was fun last night when, when uh, um, uh, Jonathan King talked about the silver wave and everybody chuckled, everybody knew exactly what that was. If you were there, you know, all the folks with silver hair, little hair, graying hair, that's the silver wave. And then the question was asked, how many of you lived through the, uh, the, 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 the 80s, the, the recession of the 80s and all the silver wave hands, went up in the air. It was really impressive to see that we all that many survived. <laughs> uh, I, I, I lived through that. Scott, you were through that. Brad, were you here at that point? In, I don't know if you were, no. but it, it was not pretty. Um, it was a difficult period. It, I, I was quite a bit younger then, and uh, my wife and I had just just purchased our first house. We, we closed on it in, in uh, 2005. You know, peak, <laughs> peak of the price, you know, the top of the market. And so Along comes the, the, this, uh, the recession caused by a, sim a situation not too dissimilar from what we might have here. And the, as you've heard, housing prices uh, fell through the floor. If you had a condo, you might, people did turn in the keys. They just left the keys on the counter and moved out. They, they were gone. That, that really did happen. Um, People lost their jobs. There was a lot of, lot of layoffs. Uh, it was not just in, the, in state uh, government, but it was, as uh, Scott said, it really it, it caught the oil industry off guard, and they were having to, having to uh, make cuts too. And those are our two fundamental uh, revenue streams, primary revenue streams from which the secondary businesses in, this, in the state exist. Your, your grocery stores, all your service industries, if there's not a paycheck coming in, they start to suffer. And we saw you know, mom and pop shops closing up uh, right and left here in town, uh, which in turn led to the, the banks that gave them loans uh, were closing. We lost a lot of banks. Half. Half, half, half our banks. Yeah. And, and actually I was very grateful that, that the bank that loaned me the money for a business park I was in Went, went under faster than we did. <laughs> because, uh, I, I had similarly just signed a, uh, uh, an agreement for part ownership in a, in a business park in Midtown Anchorage. And, you know, we could even see the, the storm clouds then when we stupidly signed the note. And it was for you know, rent that six months later that rent didn't exist anymore. And so we were rapidly underwater. The, the project was underwater. It was hemorrhaging. We were having to put money into it. 
and uh, the partners were just about to throw in the towel when the bank went belly up. And there was nobody to call us to say we're closing, we're foreclosing <laughs> on you. Uh, they, they in turn put the, the loan over to, uh, I think it was FDIC, and FDIC said, uh, you still got some tenants, right? Okay, we'll redo the note. And they redid the note and it saved the day for us, thank goodness, so we were able to make, but it was that kind of craziness that we went through at that period and it, it, it had enormous impact. Well, you can imagine what property values dropping does on your property taxes, which are what fund local government. A Anchorage, its biggest revenue source are property taxes. It was even more, more so in those days than it is now. <coughs> so once again, you know, you, you face enormous cuts. Yes? So, but um, of the three cases you presented, even the lower third case, that still deviates from the description we are making these things. Um, the lower third case, the economy, the oil economy is still functioning. It's the public sector that has drastically compressed. That's right. So, so could, you, could you envision uh, what that would look like? Uh, yes. In comparison with the 80s, would, it, you know, would the property market collapse? Would it? Um, there, we heard from um, last night uh, from uh, Jonathan King, he was looking at some Anchorage numbers. Uh, and so what he, I think the picture he left us with is Anchorage has a flat economy right now, uh, as opposed to a couple of years ago when it was pretty strong. So we're starting from a point of less than, in his opinion, less than a robust starting environment. So it's what happens from there. Uh, I think given that we have the differentiation between what might happen with the the oil sector, they're still profitable at $80 a barrel, and what would happen to the state at 80 a barrel, uh, you'd see something in between what we had happen in the late 80s and a flat situation. The air would go out of the tires slower because we have the cash reserves. If we continue, we could continue to spend for several years at, at a high level, it'd be, in our opinions, a mistake. Um, but at least we can continue spending at higher than a 2.78 sustainable level. So it's a softening, but it's, that's still not a very good. Yeah, I, I still think that I think, uh, Scott's trying to slow squeeze. I think that's. But the other difference is that <coughs> back in the 80s, uh, we had a recession, but we were knocked out of the recession right. by the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And mm -hmm. you know, that, that was a boost to the economy. Right. Several billion dollars were right. spent in cleanup, which was real money back in those days. And oil prices gradually yeah. came back. And so the, the economy recovered from that. If, if you look at the, the low case here, you know, we get hit and uh, unless something happens that we have no uh, uh, no way of anticipating, like an Exxon Valdez or another one. Um, there's, there's nothing coming next unless uh, to, to uh, pull us back out of the recession. And so the recession would be a, a much more, uh, become the sort of the Peter? standard. Take, take a shot on that one. If you go ahead and have dropping energy prices, that's an input for a lot of things. If you have dropping energy prices, assets in our permanent fund would also tend to do better, you know, in some regards. Because with lower 48, if oil's down, they, you know, notwithstanding oil states, you tend to feel better. We have a big permanent fund now. And I, I tend to be accused of always being a glass half full kind of guy, so you need to, you know, uh, adjust for that. But if you have over 2,000 bucks a year in permanent fund dividends for a family of four, that's 8,000 bucks a year. If you don't have a state income tax on it, you don't have a state sales tax on it, and that's like $850 million a year now that we're doing in dividends. You know, we dropped a bad year, and, mm -hmm. and you know, and that's a mitigating factor. But we do have, uh, I used to work for Dave Rose many years ago, and you know, it was fun to talk with him about well, what was the idea of the permanent fund. And it's like, well, you're not going to get Intel or General Motors, no matter how much you want to have do it, put a new plant into Norway. You know, not going to happen, right? And, but what you can do is you can achieve the economic diversification 
by having a permanent fund that invests in those assets and through their stocks and bonds, in effect, you diversify your economy. And it has, in fact, actually worked. And it's an interesting social experiment, just like it's an interesting social experiment that we are all trust babies. We don't pay sales tax, we don't pay income tax, and we get benefits, lots of benefits. And at some point, I mean, it's great for as long as it lasts, but it'll be interesting when you guys get into the revenue side. That, that's not an unreasonable thing. I'm not a fan of tax, and I'm a happy capitalist type of guy. Um, but it is one of those, gee, you know, we've had a great, great run. I think Mr. Hensley said that at the start, you know, and, and wonderful if it lasts and if it works. But we were a state before oil, too. Last night, um, <laughs> last night, Greg Erickson uh, went after some of the uh, some of the capital projects. And it's certainly one, it's the most vulnerable, traditionally the most vulnerable part of the budget. Those are often infrastructure projects. And now some of the ones he was pointing at, you, you may think were less than necessary. Um, but there are infrastructure projects that do support and are really essential to the development of major revenue streams. Uh, he didn't think much of Bradley Lake. He didn't think it penciled out in terms of made a profit, however, However, that is one of the best sources of low-cost energy we have, which makes our rates affordable, which makes, you know, it's one of the few things we have in Alaska that's an affordable price compared to the lower 48. It's our electric rates, so. Could I, uh, could I, uh, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I just interject to complete the thought. I mean, in other words, comparing what the scenario there looks like compared with the 80s. Right. The image that comes to my mind is sort of a, a graciously managed, intelligently managed, Decline. I, I don't mean a decline in the negative sense. The image that comes to my mind is, is Pittsburgh. You know, I'm, I'm from Detroit originally. So Pittsburgh, I mean, st a, a one industry town, steel, uh, steel went away, and you had a you know, traumatic decade and a half. But right. frankly, the, the city fathers, if you look at uh, the Moravian plan, the President Carnegie Mellon's right. plan, uh, to reconstruct Pittsburgh as a smaller city around right. Eds and Meds, you know, uh, mm -hmm. You know, for areas that were more sustainable service areas, um, but a much smaller town. A real, right. If you if you're there, it's a very nice, it's very city, nice city. Very nice very city. Very nice but, city. But, but um, not quite an order of magnitude, but a third its size, uh, more sustainable and prosperous, but but without that huge driver of steel. That's right. And now it's a fabulous oil and gas town, and the Marcellus makes as much gas as Canada <laughs> did, and nobody saw it six years ago. So, so um, under this, oops, I should have moved my slides ahead here. Well, before you get into uh, the consequences, yes, um, there are two things that kind of uh, interest me, and one is not too many people have talked about uh, the viscous oil and what, why is that such a giant challenge that we can't, we don't hear much huh? about it as a potential, uh, you know. Source of new oil when, when they're doing fracking, which seems to be like an extensive deal as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is uh, is Anwar. I mean, you're you're an economist and whatnot, <laughs> so you're not politicians. But right. I mean, at one point they did approve Anwar, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Clinton, in the Clinton era, but he vetoed it. Um, so. You know, if Hillary doesn't get elected president and say Huckabee or somebody like Huckabee, you know, gets to the presidency, I mean, yes. that creates an opportunity, would it not, uh, for Anwar? Which well, absolutely, and and um, it would for Anwar, and, and certainly getting a, a share of uh, the the royalties from OCS, it makes it more possible under a different political administration. Um, and certainly having um, Lisa Murkowski as the head of uh, the Senate uh, Energy Committee uh, is, is a great opportunity in that regard. Those could happen. Those could happen. Um, the effects of those, however, only happen when the oil flows. And that is 10 years out, at best. We have a situation where we got from three years when the budget reserve runs out till 10 years where revenue comes in, what are we going to do? The viscous oil is right there in place now. The answer to your question on viscous oil, in, in a nutshell, it's expensive, very expensive to produce. And the oil companies look and say, have I got a better place to put my investment? 
that I'll get a better return on the answer for them is yes. It's just too damn expensive to get out of the ground. Are you you're shaking your head like you know something different? Well, yeah, I know. Brad, you know something about this. Huh? Are they getting up on the viscous oil? The, the biggest... The, the biggest opportunity in viscous um, is in Milne and in um, uh, Kapar, the part of Kapari that, that borders Milne. BP's sale of Milne to Hillcorp bothers me. BP has, BP is, is much more technolo technologically advanced than Hillcorp is. Hillcorp's good at scraping rocks better mm -hmm. than other companies, but they don't have a technology arm that BP has. And the fact that BP sold Milne to Hillcorp makes me think that they're not putting as much effort into Viscous as they would have had they, had they kept Milne. Um, it is hugely expensive. The technology is not proved. It's different from shale. Shale is, is brittle and you go crack it and it releases its liquids. Viscous is like molasses and, right. and getting it getting it in a way where it will flow and getting it in a way where you don't gum up your, your production facilities d down hole below the ground and up, and up hole um, is, has been a technological challenge. Um, they think they've got ways to do it. They tried some things in Milne to do it. Um, they were making some progress, but the fact they've sold Milne, I think, is a, is a, is a sign that uh, they're not staying with it. So. It, it, Ira's right, it's very expensive and it's a very technological challenge and there are other things you can do in the world. There are other places to go in the world. They spent over $100 million trying to figure it out, right? Yep. And they are making progress. Well, they were making progress. They were. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they, ab they have, they've abandoned. I mean, they've the, abandoned it. They, they had a project in Milne and they've abandoned it. But didn't pencil out for them. No? Yeah. So how does Hillcourt make money down in the inlet when the majors left? I understand they left production. So, so like that. Hillcorp brought, ha, brings a lot of what you hear me talk about is cost structure. Hillcorp brought the cost structure way down. So the economics of, they, they don't have the same overhead, they don't have the same environmental teams, they don't, have, they don't have the same cost structure as a major does. So the economics of going out and drilling additional wells at a lower cost is a lot better than it is when you have a high cost structure. You don't, you don't go out and drill, you, don't, you can't get a return if you've got a high cost structure going out drilling additional wells. So if they produce on the slope, we'll get a royalty? Yeah, yeah, and, and, they'll, and, and what we'll see is a bump in production from existing, from existing areas, but what we won't see is the type of investment in technology, uh, what I don't anticipate we'll see is the type of investment in technology, sort of cutting edge technology it takes to go out and get those additional barrels. I'm sort of mindful of the clock here. It's, uh, we're scheduled to run only until noon, and um, I'm going to push us ahead a little bit faster here just so we make sure we get to the fun stuff at the end about how do we fix this stuff. Brad, you're on. Yeah, so picking up on cost structure. Uh, if, we're, if we're in a world where we've got $3 billion in, in revenues or to pick any of Scott's uh, middle or... <laughs> I'm not quite sure the low cases are as pessimi pessimistic. They, they may be a little bit more on the realistic edge. <laughs> uh, picking those cases where we've got to get costs down to match revenues. Um, 16, slide 16 shows where we've got to focus. Um, the UGF budget comes in two pieces. It comes in the capital budget and in the operating budget. Used to be that the, capital bu that the operating budget was a lot lower. Uh, and so capital budget is you just cut out a lot of, if you, had a, if you had a low revenue year, you just cut out a lot of projects you didn't build in a year uh, or you didn't enter into contracts for a period of time and you really managed lower, a lower revenue uh, environment by reducing the capital budget. But we've gotten ourselves into a situation where our, our base costs, the operating costs, have rapidly increased or have increased significantly. And the ability to manage low, a real, low revenue environment by cutting out capital projects is limited. We're down to a $600 million capital project, capital budget. Uh, now you wipe that out, you get to 5.6, um, which is still two billion, two billion plus over uh, what your revenue line is. So, to deal with this problem, we're going to have to go into uh, the operating budget and bring uh, operating costs down. And to give you an idea. On slide 17, to give you an idea of where those are, 
Um, the operating budget, the largest cost in the operating budget, a billion four out of the five billion six is K through 12. Second largest is Medicaid uh, at a billion one. Um, oil and gas tax credits, which Jack and I talk about a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but fund, uh, are, are used to fund new exploration projects by, by uh, small companies that don't have production yet. Um, that's about a half billion dollars. The university is about uh, uh, a third of a billion dollars. Um, and, and we're going to have to go into those things. We're going to have to go into those cost drivers. Uh, to get our cost structure down. There's, there's no way around it. We won't have the revenue. We run out of revenue, so we have to, we have to go into those. And those will be the areas that, that we're going to have to hit uh, because those are the big, those are the big cost drivers. Um, the other area is personnel count and cost. Since 2006, state employment has increased by a little bit over 10 percent. We've gone from roughly 20,000 employees to 22,000 empl employees. When Ledge Finance gives this speech, I think Amanda said this last mm -hmm. night, mm -hmm. when Ledge Finance gives this speech, they actually list personnel count and cost as the, as the third biggest driver that we're going to have to go into. We're going to have to have attrition. Uh, we're going to have to have possibly rifts uh, in state employees, reductions in force, uh, to bring those costs down. Uh, benefits are going to come under pressure. Uh, state wages are going to come under pressure. Um, not pretty, not the kind of thing you want to be talking about, but when you got $3 billion in revenue and you got $5.2 billion in expenses, the stuff you have to talk about. Scott? Two ways to balance the budget. One is to cut uh, expenditures. The other is to find new revenue sources. <clears throat> and we're fortunate in that there is a list of opportunities here. We, we have uh, a bunch in our toolkit. And here are the, the big ones that can make a significant difference. We talked about uh, the earnings reserve of the permanent fund already. And uh, <clears throat> that has about between five and seven billion dollars in it. And as I have mentioned, it's sort of being protected by the permanent fund corporation, but it is appropriable. The legislature can take that money and appropriate it. They could appropriate it into the corpus of the permanent fund as well, as they have done at some time, times in the past. But that, that's one big chunk. There, there, there are other pots of money out there, smaller pots of money, that are potentially accessible. And there's, there's a number of them in what's called designated reserves. These are smaller pots of money that are designated for a particular purpose but are not protected from being used for something else. An example would be the um, fund that is used to pay each year the power cost equalization program. There's maybe a hundred, hundred fifty million dollars in that and every year a small amount is drawn out to pay the ongoing costs of that program. Well, that money could be reallocated by the legislature to some other use. Okay. And uh, there's five or six big funds there that uh, together have about $3 billion in them. So that's, that's a source of um, cash, one-time cash as well. Oh, yes, you asked my question, one-time yeah. cash. One, one-time cash. If, if you think of the whole $3 billion, you know, that could pay for a year of a $3 billion budget deficit, right? Postpones the problem. Okay. So that's additional cash reserves. The potential revenue generating options that have been mentioned, uh, uh, if, if we introduced a combination of a sales tax and a statewide sales tax and a statewide income tax at about the same level as is typical in other states, that could generate about $1.3 billion a year. And it would be about $1,800 per person, including children. Uh, if we diverted the permanent funded dividend to general fund spending, <clears throat> this year the dividend was about $1,800, so that would, could, result in 1.3, 1.4 billion dollars. 
into the into general fund revenues. And then the final thing is the permanent fund corpus. As I've already mentioned, there's about uh, 45, 50 billion dollars, depending on what the markets are doing in the fund uh, currently. That is protected by the Constitution from being spent, but constitutions can be changed. Uh, the investment policy of the fund is uh, conservative in the sense that it invests most of its money outside of the Alaska economy as a means of reducing risks. If the Alaska economy goes bust, it doesn't impact negatively the permanent fund corpus itself, but the investment policy could be changed in such a way that it could have an impact, direct impact on uh, state revenues. I won't tell you how that might be because I don't want to give you ideas that <laughs> <laughs> could have negative consequences on the permanent fund corporation. Uh, two things, each of these methods of generating more revenue has consequences for the economy and consequences for uh, individual stakeholders, obviously. And so um, to the extent that we use any of these measures to try to close that hole, there's a big issue of fairness that comes up immediately. Are we being fair to the different stakeholders, the different groups of people in you, when we apply these measures? And two particular areas of fairness, I guess it's the next slide. Oh, I'll come back to that in a second, but you're probably thinking, oh, well, there's, there's other options that we could use to generate more revenues, aren't there? You're not telling us the whole story because we have other industries that we could tax, right? We could impose more taxes on the mining industry. We can impose more taxes on tourism, blah, 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 out-of-state non-residents who come in here and work, those sorts of things. The reality is when you start running the numbers, they don't pencil out because oil is so much bigger than everything else. Uh, the taxes that you could generate from uh, increased uh, squeezing of other industries just don't amount to more than a hill of beans. For example, if we were to fill a $3 billion budget hole by taxing tourists through some mechanism, we'd have to tax each tourist that comes into the state $1,000. That's not very realistic. If we wanted to get that from uh, the fishing industry, and uh, next year uh, we had a salmon harvest of 100, 100 million fish, we'd have to put a tax of $30 on each of those fish. That's not going to happen. No? Uh, we have a, an order of magnitude challenge here. If we, if we doubled the um, uh, fuel tax that we pay on gasoline from what it is today, and, and we're the lowest in the United States. That would take in $30 million. Well, $30 million is real money, but it's, it's not $3 billion. It's 1% of $3 billion. So uh, certainly we should look at our tax structure to see whether it's uh, reasonable, but it's not going to solve our revenue problem. Invest in economic diversification. I call this the zombie solution <laughs> because, because it, it, it's dead, but it won't go away. It just keeps coming back. Uh, we've been talking about economic diversification as a solution to our problems for 40 years, and we've, we've worked at it. It's not that we haven't thought of doing it. We've worked at it. We've made some progress, but uh, make a long story short, uh, oil it was the name of the game 40 years ago. It is the name of the game today. The economic diversification that we've, we've managed to do has made marginal progress in solving our fiscal problem. But it's not, we're not going to diversify enough in the next five years to fill a gap that opens uh, five years from today. Uh, the final thing is uh, change the permanent fund investment mix to increase potential return. Well, 
uh, the, the permanent fund uh, portfolio is invested in, um, as, as a portfolio that balances return and risk. And uh, we should continually review that to see if we're at the right place in that, uh, in that balance. If we're taking the right amount of risk to get the right amount of return. The permanent fund historically is, has been very successful in meeting their 5% target. And I think actually they've done a little better over the long, long haul. But that's something that we should continually be reviewing because that's our biggest resource at $50 billion. We have to, we have to husband that and take care of that. But we've got to make sure that it's doing the best possible job that it can. If we could get another percent rate of return, that would be equivalent to today, $500 million. So that's not, uh, that's not chicken feed. <laughs> so those are, uh, those are options. So, the so now we're gonna lead into uh, what's the path forward? And, and first, kind of an, a, a big aerial view, what do we wanna be like as a state? Yeah, well, th this is not an economic decision. This is a decision that we all need to make together. Uh, the economists can tell us, well, under certain economic conditions, this is likely to happen, but uh, where we want to go and who we want to be, that's a decision that we all make. It's not one for the economists. But um, I think we can generally agree that we want to try to maintain the quality of life that we've been blessed with here, not only for the current generation, but for future generations as well, and to, to create a stable economic and a fiscal environment where uh, <coughs> private businesses can invest and grow, and grow. We can have increasing employment opportunities and we don't get jacked around in our public sector. One year we have a lot of money and the next year we don't have any money and uh, how can you plan in that kind of environment. Implementation, some obvious things that we want to take into account when we're thinking about implication. Treating all Alaskans fairly. I mean, we're entering a period where we're going to have to have lower expectations. We all need to be inside the tent and take part in that process. Nobody should be exempt because if people don't think that the process is fair, it's going to fall apart. And, and treating Alaskans fairly is not only those who are in the room today, but it's importantly future generations as well because this at least those of us at the table here feel that the uh, wealth from petroleum belongs to all generations of Alaskans. That's what the Constitution says. That's what the Permanent Fund Corporation was set up for. And so we need to be fair to future generations. And that's tough because they're not here to speak for themselves. And finally, we need to reform the budget process to create more uh, understanding and transparency so that the public understands the fiscal challenge we face and can contribute to uh, a solution. And I, my section is, is over. I've said I've tended to be sort of the bringer of pessimistic news in the past. I, I feel a little bit more optimistic today, more confident, because we do have these opportunities for alternative revenues. And um, I think the drop in oil prices today is, is a good shock therapy <laughs> mm -hmm. that we haven't had in the past. Okay. Moving forward. But the shock therapy requires that we act on it. And exactly. That we, and that we bring our cost structure down and that we do it in a way that not only gets us, gets this generation through the next few years, but sets up the state to be sustainable over, the, over a long term. ICER has done a lot of work, uh, and for those of you who want a deeper dive into this, there are some great ICER papers, WebNote 14, WebNote 16, um, that, that really go into what a, what a sustainable budget uh, is, is like. <coughs> Basically, it's a budget that says, um, if we spend this amount today, and either don't hit savings or sa save whatever revenues we have over this amount, we can continue spending that amount onto the future. We can continue to have the same revenue level 
into the future. And for those of you who have 401ks or, or retirement plans, it works the same way. You take the, the revenue you have over the spending level, you put it into a nest egg, it will generate revenues in the out years. And so as oil values or oil revenues decline, the additional revenues that are being generated from that nest egg supplement it and keep you on a, on a stable path. That's the goal, I think, all of us at this table. It's the goal that Governor Walker, Governor-elect Walker articulated during the campaign to put Alaska on a sustainable path where we don't go through these cycles of boom and bust, where future, where we're not, where this generation's not putting the next generation at risk by consuming all of the, all of the revenue now uh, and leaving very little left for the next generation. But it takes two things to achieve that. One is we have to bring our cost structure down because we're going through whatever savings we have right now to keep, to make this generation, keep this generation happy but as we're depleting savings, we're saving that nest egg that we have to have for the future to generate the revenue to provide a sustainable future for the, for the next generation. To the extent we consume savings, to the extent we consume these fiscal reserves that Scott was talking about are available, to the extent we continue overspending and drain the SBR and, and CBR, to the, certainly to the extent we think about taking permanent fund earnings and ultimately the permanent fund corpus, what all we're doing is making our lives better at the expense of the ne of future generations. We're essentially saying we're not going to tax ourselves to have the quality of life we're having right now. We're just going to leave that to the next generation and they're going to have to tax themselves. Not only are they going to have to tax themselves to have revenue, they're going to have to accept a lower quality of life. So we can put Alaska on a sustainable path. It was better, it was easier at $105 oil than it's going to be at $75 oil, but you can put Alaska on a sustainable path by looking at what you have to bring your cost structure down to, to, to survive, to, to sustain uh, uh, a state spending at, at, at that level. And if you do it right, if you do it where everybody, every generation shares equally in the wealth that's coming from oil, then each generation has sort of a base level of revenue and if any generation feels it needs more than the base level of revenue it's getting, it can tax itself. We want a little bit better uh, uh, lifestyle, we want a few more schools, we want to put a baseball field in Sitka, then we can tax ourselves for that extra cost, but without stealing it from the next generation, without taking it from savings uh, for the next generation. So there are, there are benefits to sustainable, to sustainable uh, putting Alaska on a sustainable path. The benefits are we have a stable economy, we have stable state spending, we, we're not burdening future generations, but you have to do it. You have to bring the cost structure down and you have to avoid tapping in uh, to the fiscal reserves. The, uh, I think I just went through two slides in once. Uh, 23. Um, Kitchen up. Huh? Kitchen up. Okay. <laughs> On reforming the budgeting process, part of the, prob part of the problem that, that there, there's two, problems to me uh, with our current budgeting process. One, Alaskans aren't, enga Alaskans aren't engaged in their budgeting process. Uh, we go down and we tell our legislators we want more. We want a football field. We want AstroTurf. We want a new sports arena. We want a baseball field in Sitka. We want an aquatic center in, more in education, Bethel. Education, education, education. Huh? More education money. We want more education money. But, but we, we want more and more and more. But, but we don't know the consequences of that. We don't know the consequences of what we're asking for. We don't know what we're pushing to future generations when we, when we ask for that. And part of the, part of the budgeting, budgeting process, I, if, if we're going to go to a sustainable future, part of the budgeting process has to be, we have to put boundaries on ourselves. We have to tell ourselves, we have to tell legislators, we have to tell ourselves, this is what we can afford to spend if we're going to have a sustainable future. This is the, this is the amount of spending that you, can, that you can engage in. If you do more than that, you're stealing it from future generations, you're stealing it from yourself if oil prices go down. This is, this is, what, you, this is what you can spend, and we need to put boundaries on ourselves so that we don't just overspend without really understanding the consequences. So there's, there's some benefit to reforming the budget process to have a series of triggers to have a series of, of information that is available to the public uh, in knowing what the sustainable budget number is uh, and in encouraging public more public participation in the budgeting process so that when we, know, when we go down to legislators and ask them to send, spend more, they can push back and they can say, yes, but you're stealing it from future generations. Yes, you're, but you're, uh, you're putting yourselves in peril if, uh, if oil prices change. 
And I think there's, I think there's a, a, a usefulness to having a, a, a budget reform act come up in this legislature or the next that tries to increase the transparency of the budget process, tries to increase uh, the understanding that we have as Alaskans of what we're doing when we, when we spend those uh, additional amounts. On the, uh, the final couple of slides, what does it take to get there? Uh, this is something that I talked about uh, in response to a question last night. One, I think we have to, the leadership in the state, the governor in the state has to provide a vision. Uh, Alaska does retain a strong resource base, as, as Jack talked about, as Scott's talked about. We have a lot of oil out there. We have the opportunity to uh, develop it. But we have to revamp spending to live within our means. We can't, as a state, continue to consume more than, our fair, than this generation's fair share of revenue. We're putting future generations at risk. We're putting this generation at risk by spending more and not having the, the money in the next year when we need it to continue to maintain basic, basic services. So we have to, I, I think it's important for the, for the governor and for others to articulate a vision. This is where we're going. We're going to a sustainable future. This is what it's going to take to get there, uh, and these are the things we need to do. We need to educate Alaskans about, uh, about what the fiscal situation is. Uh, we need to talk about it. Those of you who were there last night, I, I, my, my recommendation is that every state leader, uh, uh, both from the administration and if you can get them to do it, legislators start every speech by saying this is Alaska's fiscal situation. This is where we are. This is what we need to do to, to, to get ourselves out of this situation. This is what we need to do to have a sustainable future. Alaskans need to understand their fiscal situation better uh, than we do now. Part of the reason we've gotten into this is because we haven't understood the situation we've been. Legislators have, have just got additional requests and additional requests, and they've said yes and yes and yes. And we've created a cost structure that we can't, that, that we can't sustain. So we need, to, we need for Alaskans to understand better. Uh, going forward what uh, the fiscal situation is that the state operates in. Some have suggested that we would have that an income tax is beneficial not so much to generate revenue but to generate understanding. Mm -hmm. If you have an income tax, uh, you're going to say, oh wait, what are you spending that money on? Yeah, because you're going you're to take part of it out of my pocket. Uh, and some have suggested that, the, that one of the ways to help educate Alaskans is to have an income tax. I don't go that far. But, but we have to find some way for Alaskans to become more engaged in the process, or else we're going to continue going down this, this boom and bust uh, cycle. Um, we, ha we have both shor short and intermediate actions that we need to take. Right now, today, we are uh, bleeding cash. We are taking out of savings $10 million a day. We will, be we will take $3 billion out of savings uh, in fiscal year 2015. If we don't change costs, don't change spending, We'll take three billion more out. We'll take three billion more out, and then we're done. We've, we've gone through, we've gone through savings. So we have to cut down on the cash bleed today. I was over at one of the transition policy meetings this morning, uh, talking to uh, a former lieutenant governor, uh, who was uh, uh, saying that you know we it, it's important to take steps now. Some of you who were here maybe in 2006, we had an episode on the North Slope where we had a leak. Uh, at one of the fields on the North Slope, we had to shut down the pipeline for several days, maybe as long as a week or maybe more than a week, uh, and the state's cash flow uh, was, was cut off. The governor at the time, Frank Murkowski, a lot of people criticize him for a lot of things, but one thing he did right in that situation, he immediately cut back on spending. He cut back on travel, he, cut, he, he uh, 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 had a hiring freeze, he cut back on capital spending. He took actions then to stop the bleed. We haven't done that, and we're going $10 million in the hole every day that we don't do that. So we need short-term actions to, to reduce spending now. And then we have to, in the, in the longer term, not too long, uh, in the in intermediate term, we have to take actions to get our cost structure down um, and, and bring uh, the spending down to a level that, that we can afford uh, based upon uh, the level of revenues that we have. Next steps, short term is, uh, these are just uh, recommendations to get the thought process started. Uh, uh, Jonathan King said last night, if he were king, he would do this. Uh, these may be recommendations that if I were uh, something or Scott were you know, something, we would, we would sec suggest this. But immediately uh, reduced uh, the remaining FY 2015 spending, 
uh, the operating budget by 10% overall, immediately implement hiring freezes, per, start looking at uh, curtailing, well, curtail travel, start curtailing uh, conferences, start curtailing the $150,000 for uh, episodes like, uh, like we have today. Take steps to stop the bleeding now, because the bleeding now is, uh, uh, is, is going to have long-term consequences by draining our savings. Um, and, I, and consistent with what Greg Erickson said last night, suspend capital projects uh, uh, that are not yet initiated, start reducing uh, the spend rate on capital projects we, we know are not going to go forward that are costly and we're just spending money on studies that, that really are not going to go anyplace. Um, and evaluate those that we even have in process, evaluate those for uh, suspension or reduction of, of spend. We're living beyond our means. We, as a state, we are doing the same thing as, as you in your private lives. If you're spending double what your revenue is, you're putting yourself in, at risk uh, going forward. You're draining your reserves, or you're running up credit card bills that you're going to have to pay at some point. That's what this state is doing right now. So taking steps like all of us would in our, in our private lives if we had a reduction of, in our income of half, taking those steps now to suspend uh, spending or to reduce spending. In the, in the upcoming uh, session, uh, the next step is to reduce overall spending by an additional 10 percent um, and enact uh, budgeting process reform to increase transparency to get Alaskans more engaged in the budgeting process to know what's going on. And then the final thing, and this is, Susan, something I mentioned last night that I think you mentioned earlier, have create a commission or create an entity similar to the BRAC, similar to the Base Realignment uh, Commission, or similar to uh, uh, the Simpson-Bowles Commission that we've seen at the federal level. Get a commission that, 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 that takes some of the heat off politicians that looks as a, as a, at a, business, as a business perspective on where the state is in terms of spending and comes back with recommendations on how to get us uh, to sustainable levels. That does two things. One, it gets a broader perspective. It takes, well, three things. It gets a broader perspective, gets more people involved in the process. Two, uh, it uh, uh, brings additional uh, uh, public awareness of the problem uh, to bear on the problem. Uh, and three, it creates business leaders who will then act as advocates, who become informed about the situation and will then act as advocates in going out and reaching and engaging the public to, to bring spending down. It's worked with the BRAC, it's worked, it worked to some degree with Simpson Bulls, uh, and I believe would have, uh, would have some benefits um, here. So that's where we are, that's where we are headed if we don't do anything about it, and that's a suggestion on what to do to avoid the consequences of where we're headed. Yes, ma'am. I just have one comment. Um, so I just also have a suggestion. You know, I'm, I'm kind of in the political world a lot, and I just I feel like it's really incumbent upon all of us in this room and all of us in the state and is to create a space for politicians where they can talk about these things. You know, <laughs> I think it's late. You know, last session, or actually last year, some of our politicians talked about, talked about cutting the education budget. I mean, oh my God, they got totally slammed and slayed by the same, frankly, by a lot of the same candidates who then talked about how they wanted to be this cost. But however, this other candidate wants to cut the education budget. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, so that's, we just really need to have an area and a space where politicians we need to be able to protect them, that they can actually talk about those things without worry of retribution, uh, uh, fear of retribution. I think that's fair, but I think, I think get it, getting that space to get to that space, people need to understand the fiscal situation. They need to understand, you know, why it's important for them for them to have that space. You can't create that space arbitrarily. You have to say, we need to cut costs. We need yeah. the, the state's heading over the fiscal cliff. The state can't afford what it's doing, and as a consequence, we need to allow politicians. We need to give politicians space to talk about how to how to get there. Didn't I talk a lot about that? I talked to the, the public was pretty aware that we needed to cut costs when we were talking about cutting the education. Well, that was during a session before the, pi the price of oil fell. And the price of oil has fallen since the close of the last session. It's a different ballgame now. <clears throat> and part of what we're doing here, part of what the panel did last night, and part of what I'm already seeing in the papers and probably your blog here uh, reporting is what came out of last night's session, that conversation. It's a different conversation as of now. And there were a lot of legislators there last night, a lot of people who of, of great influence who are 
have have uh, Rolodexes, if that's old fashioned, uh, you know, Facebook page lists and uh, email lists and that communicate broadly. You all do. This is our conversation from this point forward. It's a ch we've it's changed. Well, let's give them a big hand.